Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Children of God, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy, happy Sabbath. Happy, happy, Sabbath. Happy, happy Sabbath. We thank God so much for giving us another opportunity to come before him and worship him. Bible says in Psalm 133, 133 verse 1 that how beautiful and pleasant it is for the children of God to come together to worship in unity. It's so nice because there God is with us. Throughout the whole week we've been together to worship God, to pray to him and also ask him for forgiveness of sins. And I know for sure that indeed he has touched us and he has forgiven us our sins and he's going to bless us again. More especially, he's going to give us the Holy Spirit so we can serve him in truth and then in spirit. Those of us who are joining us via the internet, we want to thank you so much for your time. And yesterday we invited you specially that you taste the Sabbath with us. And we believe that you are there. Today is going to be the end of the week of prayer. And we want to, you to be there. And then invite your friends to us so that we can all pray together and then bring everything to an end peacefully. We thank you so much. We know that the prayer that we started this week will not end. It will continue. As we are also praying for you. So that we can all pray for each other for the history of the, 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 the coming of the Lord. We thank you so much. I want to invite the singing group so they come up front so that we can all sing together as we worship the Lord. Thank you. Let's stand up and worship our God, wear your mask and praise Him. Just love of Christ. 
Just want to read on Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verses 16. Let us there before come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yes, um, God is not far away, He's nearer than we can think about it. And now it's our turn to do the next step to Him and feel His presence. And we want to just sing that in the next song, and we just want to come nearer to our God. for this morning and for this new day and um, thank you that we can all be gathered here once again to listen to your word and to uh, to fellowship with our brothers and sisters this week has been a blessing to us and yeah let let hearts and minds be touched and draw us closer to you O oh lord yeah in jesus name we pray amen
So, this is the last part of the week of prayer. And uh, we want to get some testimonies from those who are joined this week. And I ask several person to come to the front and give a feedback. What is your experience by the week of prayer? Please come. That is Azamoa, Melody, and John. Please come to the front. So, <laughs> come left. So, yes, the woman in the middle, that is really nice. So, my question is, uh, what, what is that? What, what is spe was specially for you in the week of prayer? Okay, I think um, the sermon was good, and also the snacks after the sermon was also good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, I learned a lot, especially yesterday, with the book of Matthew. Uh, we always uh, read about the Samaritan woman. But yesterday, my focus was drawn to the fact that sometimes as Christians, we only focus on uh, the earthly things, forgetting about what God actually wants us to see. And that, for me, was, uh, uh, was an eye-opener for me to understand what God wants me to see rather than focusing on what. Uh, uh, the earthly things that is on this earth. Thank you. Melody, okay. what's your impression? Yeah, so what I really like about the week of prayer is, um, yeah, so this time to pray, it's like, a crea it's more like, a, um, it's not a traditional sermon, I will say. It's like more creative and everything, and an atmosphere and everything. So um, sometimes during the day we necessarily don't have like or we don't have time to pray or we don't really think about it and like it's the evening so yeah it's a very um, good moment I think to pray and for me it worked very well so yeah after a while yeah sometimes I forget to pray so yeah it's a very good moment for this. Thank you. John is one of those persons who was involved in the program but he was never here on the stage. He was every time 50 minutes before the, the, the program starts here on stage, he was for the interview up there. If you want to see him there, then look in internet and look what uh, is there. Yeah, for me, two things stood out. Number one was um, the participation of the One Year for Jesus. You know, every evening I would see how involved they were. You know, I've been meeting the previous sets of One Year for Jesus. But these ones are very special mm -hmm. because they are always cheerful, they are always smiling, and they are always willing to help, you know. End of the program, they will ask you, do you want something? You know, I've met some friends among them. So that was special for me, and I pray that they will continue to do it that way. The second one was the preacher. He could connect with everyone. He could connect with the young, he could connect with the old, he could connect with those who were viewing online. And I think that was special. Thank you. So uh, that is a good word. Now we want to have the preacher in the front. You can go and sit. Thank you. So um, in the end of a week of prayer, um, we want no more to introduce uh, the preacher, and uh, I think you know him all, the most know him, but we want to say thank you, and we want to give you a gift that is a special gift for you. But uh, I, we have done it already in a German service, uh, and we gave him a uh, can you lift up the, uh, the special gift? It look, yes, show them this. So that looks like an, a rakete. What is a ra rocket where you can lift up? But that is for the Christmas time. Each day you can find chocolate in it. Yeah? <laughs> and I told him he has to share it with his wife. So. <laughs> Okay. But now we have another gift for you. 
because I'm not sure if you get it already, that is a shirt, and sometimes it's cold, because Paul comes from Brazil, <laughs> he needs it warm, yeah? <laughs> that is a special gift from us. Thank you. <laughs> and I would like to, that someone can subscribe, but it's too dark, mm. yeah? So the other idea is that we give you another shirt. I know your other one is carried so often, so it looks not lila, <laughs> it looks yes. more white. <laughs> so that is a special shirt. That is your size. But yesterday evening, we put oh. something on your back. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> okay. So you can remember okay, us. Okay, I'll carry you with me wherever I go now. <laughs> yes, yes. And you can wash it even uh, it's written something because it's a special pen. Okay. If there is someone who likes to subscribe okay, uh, again after the service. Okay. okay? Yeah. That's just the second one for yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank okay. you very much. <laughs> so we thank you that you was here for a week. And who don't know this, we have had asked <laughs> him one and a half year we planned that he comes in the springtime, 2020. 20. And, but of Corona, we have to skip it. Then we thought maybe 2020 in the autumn but we have to skip it to the spring this year, but we have to skip it again. <laughs> and now, thank you for your patience and that you're ready to come. And uh, it was really a blessing time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay, let us stand up for another song and wear your mask.
there are any children who would like to come up, I can tell them the story. And if not, I can just hope there's children through the internet, or I can tell it to all of the adults. So I'll tell it to all of the adults. <laughs> so when I was a kid, my family used to go camping every year at this site that was near a river. Uh, and it was always extremely warm. And so what we mostly wanted to do was go swim in the river, but there wasn't always an adult to watch us. So when we couldn't do that, my brother and I used to take our bikes and ride around the campsite. There was this road with like, it was very rough gravel and stones that came down a hill and all the way around the campsite. But it got boring after a while because it's not that big and you can only go around in a circle so many times before you get very bored, especially when you're like eight or nine. So then my dad had an idea. My dad is very good at ideas that are lots of fun, but possibly dangerous. So he said, let's, he had a bike too. He's like, let's take our bikes to the top of the hill and we'll pedal off as fast as we possibly can, and then we'll go shooting down the hill and around the circle. So we tried it. And the secret is you have to go very fast, because if you don't go fast enough on a bike, you tilt over, and also it's fun. So we would get ready, and we would push off, and you kind of go, and you go faster, and it sort of boom, right around the whole circle. You don't even have to pedal. It was great. My brother tried it, and he got really scared, and he pushed on his brakes the whole time, and he ended up just kind of tilting over partway down the hill and scraped his knee, so he didn't like it. He stayed home. But I did it all the time. It scared my poor mother, because all she heard is my dad was like, I have an idea, I'm going to take the kids to go do something. Then about five minutes later, she hears, for like five minutes, and then she hears me going back up the hill, and then again, and I would scream the whole time, every time. It was like a roller coaster. I thought it was great. <laughs> Mom didn't think it was great. But I did. So one day, everyone went into town to go shopping, except for me, my brother, and my grandma. And because Stephen didn't like the hill, he stayed at the campsite. My grandma was washing dishes or something, so I went down the hill for the last time. The first couple of times I went, it was fine. It was great. Same thing, screaming the whole time. And uh, then finally, I started off, and I went a little too fast. And I started going down the hill. And the pedals started to go too fast, and my feet flew off the pedals, and then I was trying to get my feet back on the pedals, and they kept just kicking the pedals faster. And I hit a stone, and the bike started to wobble, and before I knew it, I'd flipped over the handlebars and landed and slid the rest of the way down the hill in the gravel. So I had started screaming because it was fun. I started screaming because I was scared partway through, and I started screaming because I was scraping through gravel for the end of it. And... Uh, I was, I was like eight, so I was fairly sure I was dying. I was fine. Um, but I look up in my haze of pain, and I see my brother running towards me as fast as he possibly can, and I can see my grandma kind of running behind him. And she told me later that he had been sitting and playing with his toys, and he had heard me screaming, and he had looked up and gone, ah, Emily's having fun. Then he goes back to playing, and all of a sudden he goes, Emily's not having any fun! <laughs> he jumps up and he runs towards me. So, and she didn't hear any difference. It all sounded like the same screaming, but he knew me well enough to know the difference between joy and terror and pain and whatever else. So I think God is somewhat like that. He knows us very well. He doesn't need us to change our tone or be specific about how we're feeling. He hears us when we're screaming, when we're quiet, at any point. So thank you for listening. At this time, I want to invite the preacher to be with us. Pastor, be with me here. And then I would like to employ you to be on your feet so we can pray together. Let us pray. Our Lord and Savior, we thank you so much for the gift of life. We thank you for forgiveness of sins. We thank you for bringing us together to worship you. We pray to commit those who are watching us near and far into your care. If anybody has a petition or request before the O oh Lord, answer him or her. Touch to us. Talk to us. Give us the spirit to understand you. Throughout the whole week, we've been speaking to us, and we want you to continue to talk to us so that we will have personal connection and personal relationship with you. 
Sometimes we worship with our mouths and then our hearts are far. But this time, I want you to come closer to us so that we can feel your presence every day. Oh, Lord, we pray that if one with the other, because of our sins, our names have been blotted from the book of life, we plead with you that we write your names in the book of life for us. Oh, Lord, help us so that we can live for thee. We commit thy servant into your care. Be with him. Touch his lips. The message that you have for us, speak through him to us. He's sinful. He has no message. You have a message for us. Speak to us so that we can hear you. We know you are with us. And whenever we pray together in faith, you always listen to us because you promise us. We thank you very much for this opportunity to come to worship you. We are most grateful. We've prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You sit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. We have now come to the very last sermon of this week of prayer. We're closing the week of prayer. It's a shame, but I'm a little bit happy about it because it's very tiring to preach every evening. But it's, I do what I like, and I, appreciate, I, I have appreciated being here with you and being able to share the Word of God with you. And throughout the week, we have been talking about one theme re- repeatedly, and that is how God intensely searches for mankind, and He reaches out for us, and He wants to start a personal and intimate relationship with every one of us. But now for this last message, I wanted to start with a question for you to think about. You don't have to answer it, just think about it. And the question is, why do you want to go to heaven? You ever given it a thought? I mean, I suppose all of us here want to go to heaven, right? But the why question is something we don't really think about. At least I think we don't do that often. Of course. I mean, of course I want to go to heaven. I always heard sermons in, 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 in the church, and uh, always we would talk about heaven, and of course I want to go there. But, like, when I ask you, what is the first thing that comes to your head? Why do you want to go to heaven? And we do have several reasons why we may want to go to heaven. For example, the fact that we're going to have no, we're going to have no suffering there. And suffering, it's what gets the worst of us here on this planet. It's one of the greatest arguments people use to tell that God doesn't exist because they're suffering and there there's going to be no suffering anymore only joy and happiness but then beyond suffering there's no well that is contained in suffering but there's not going to be death anymore and there's not going to be illness anymore and for not for us that are living in the middle of a pandemic you may think okay so I'm not going to need to wear masks anymore option high I don't need I don't need to keep a distance from people anymore and there's no, not going to be any illness anymore, especially for people who were maybe have a terminal illness or like experiencing cancer or something or of the sorts. You talk about heaven and they earnestly want to get to heaven because you're not going to be ill anymore. But there are other reasons, and there's one I can't understand quite well. Uh, my first year here in Frenzel, we had just gotten here about seven, eight, nine months in Frenzel, and then we got the news that my mother-in-law had died in Brazil. And that's one of the reasons also why someone want to get to heaven. Because you're going to be endly, you're, you're, at, at last you're going to be able to see the people who you love and you lost to death. And you miss them. And they're going to meet. We're going to meet there. And we're going to be in joy with them forever. So, of course, there's another reason why you might have said or might have thought, that's why I want to go to heaven. But, well, <laughs> there's also this reason. Um, and it's especially for kids. Um, a good reason, but I think we can have joy there as well. You say, I want to go to heaven because, you know, I have such a terrible life here on this earth, but up in heaven, the streets are going to be made of gold, and you can imagine the city and paradise and everything that we're going to have there, and finally, in heaven, I will be able to live in a mansion. Not anymore like in a room, in a dorm, that <laughs> barely has a bathroom, Right? I'm going to have a mansion for myself. And that's also, that's been promised to us. So you may think that. 
okay, I'm going to live in heaven, and we're going to have everything, like stuff that here I, I, on earth I'm deprived from, I'm going to have there. Or you may also say another reason, yeah, the Bible says we are going to be transformed into glory, so we are going to have perfect bodies. You may think about your physical, your physical flaws, but not only that, for someone who is like a handicapped person who cannot walk or who cannot see. I told you during the week how I'm, I'm, I'm colorblind and how I cannot see every color. I can't wait to be able to see every color. I mean, I showed you my glasses, but they just correct the problem. They don't fix it. They're just a temporary correction. And I will finally be able and not wear any glasses anymore and just see everything in high definition without using the glasses, I can't wait for that. But I'm going to tell you something. The greatest reason for us to be ha in heaven, and there's beyond, I mean, before this reason, all of those have actually, they pale off. The greatest reason for us to, be, to go to heaven is to finally be in the presence of the Lord. And finally meet with him and walk in his presence. And like Adam and Eve, to share in his glory and see him face by face. That is the meaning of heaven. That is the reason why we go to heaven, to be able to see him again. And during this week, we've been talking all about this, all about this encounter. I mean, we talked about convergence and how God creates opportunities to meet with mankind so that he can be with them because he loves us. And we started in the Garden of Eden. We were talking about how God creates man after the image of God. We went through the Bible, but starting there, you remember, as I said, that men and e Adam and Eve, they were created after this image of God, and they were able to reflect the glory of God like a mirror. And they were supposed to share in the glory of God again, and they were in the presence of God. In this sense, I can say, if heaven is being in the presence of God, I can say Adam and Eve were already in heaven. They already experienced heaven in the Garden of Eden. But then what happens? Sin comes into the story, this intruder. And it creates a separation, creates this wall of separation. And mankind now has to hide from the Lord. I mean, they want to hide from the Lord, but the Lord wants to go after them. The Lord wants to go after mankind. So we saw how God lovingly comes into the garden without accusations, and he invites Adam and Eve outside of their hiding place and tells them about this message of forgiveness and tells them about this message of repentance and salvation. And then we see that this, at this very point, God, Jesus, he starts this intense search for mankind where we are always running and he's coming after us. And then a few thousand years later, we visited Moses on the top of the mountain as he's talking to God, and God is involved in this cloud, and he can't see the presence of God. He can't see the glory, but he can hear the voice, and then he comes with this very daring request, very bold request to God and says, God, I want to see your glory. And then God says, Moses, you can't see my face because you're a sinner, but I'll show you some of my glory. And then he walks past the rock, and Moses sees the back of God. And he doesn't realize, but he starts shining. He starts gleaning with the glory of God. But God, while he's up there, he says, he tells Moses, and then it was the next sermon, Moses, I don't want to stay up here. I want to be with my people. And you see, all throughout the Bible, from the beginning of the, up to the end, this yearning, this longing that God has to be with us. I mean, he's up in heaven, of, of course, all right, but he still wants to be there where we are. He doesn't want to leave us. And then he tells Moses, Moses, I want to go down there. I will come down to where the people are so we will build me a sanctuary there so that I can abide, so that I can dwell among you, among the people. So he dwells among the people. And we saw this wonderful method, message of salvation where people, they sinful people, they would have to come to the presence of God to find forgiveness. He invites them into his sanctuary to find forgiveness, to find salvation. He is inviting us to his presence just like he did from the beginning. And that was the greatest revelation of God's glory so far. His very visible presence was in the sanctuary. Of course, it was limited. Nobody could get in there, but he was there. But the thing is, that was yet a bigger revelation 
of God to happen. Now, I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> I know uh, some of you come from Africa, and I had the opportunity to visit Africa twice in my life. Once, I went to South Africa for a youth congress from the church, 2017, 16, I don't know when it was anymore. And there was another time, and there's another chance I went to Africa, this time to Tanzania with Laszlo. I hope, you, I, I think most of you know he has a project there with the Maasai. And I visited the place, and then I got a church, and he said, like, the, he divided the group, the students, in, into groups, and he said, so you're going to be responsible for, the, for our church, and you have to preach to do, like, an evangelism in the church. And he said, okay. So I came to my church. It was in the, on the tribe of Karao. Um, it's in the middle of the savannah. Now, I know I told you already I come from Brazil, and many people think there are just forests and monkeys there. But we do actually have cities, big cities. And I was born in a city. And now I come to the middle of the savannah. This is, we also have like indigenous people living in the forest in Amazon. Like you have like indigenous people living also in the, in the middle of the savannah. So we come to, the, to this place in the middle of the wilderness. There's no electricity. There's no uh, flowing water. Everything is different from what I know. And... I start wondering and questioning myself, how am I supposed to connect with these people? I mean, we come from different worlds. It's the same thing if I went to the Amazon forest, there in the middle of the indigenous people that have never seen a car. How am I supposed to connect to them? And now I have to preach about the gospel message, and, but everything I knew, every example, every story, they come from my background, from this mind, mindset. And this is the paradigm of the missionary. Because he does not, he has to speak the message, but in a manner that it will meet the people where they are. So I started thinking, yeah, okay, okay, so I'm going to talk about Jesus. But, I mean, they barely see a car here because there are no roads. They are literally in the middle of the wilderness. We have to drive through the savannah about, I think, 40 minutes, one hour to get there. And, uh, I mean, I know phones, I know computers, I know cars, I know cities. But it's not, it doesn't, some of the people of this village, they had never been outside. How am I going to connect to them? And then I had, God helped me, and I had the greatest idea. I came in the evening, and I would talk to them, and I asked them a question. I like to ask questions in sermons. And I said, okay, I was being translated because their language, also called Maasai, I couldn't speak it. And then I asked, okay, so I'm here now, I'm, pre I'm, I'm talking to you, but I'm using a translation. But I want to ask you a question. What would I have to do if I were to become a Messiah? I want you to tell me. And they were all there. The church was packed. A lot of children in the church. So what do I have to do? Let's say I want to become a Messiah. What do I have to do? There was no answer. And then I, well, I made a suggestion. Okay. So, you know, um, they wore these colorful robes, um, typical from some countries in Africa, and uh, typical from them. And then I said... Let's say the following. I'll go tomorrow to the Maasai Markt where they sell their stuff. And I'll buy me such a nice rope. And tomorrow, more, uh, tomorrow evening, when I come to church, I'll be dressed as a Maasai. So I asked, will I have become a Maasai if I'm dressing like you? The kids, they were so eager to say, yes, you are. No, I am not. Because there's more to learn. I mean, I may be dressed as a Maasai, but I still can't understand you. When you speak to me, I need a translator. So let's say I'm going to stay here for about two years, two, three years, and I'm going to live with you and learn your language. I'm going to go to school, and uh, I don't know if they ever like, had a Maasai school for a lang of school of language, but let's say I will learn your language. And then in two or three years, I'll come here again, I'll stand before you, and I will be able to talk to you without a translator. I'm going to talk to you myself. Will I have become a Maasai then? And the kids, yes, you will. No, I won't, because there's still more stuff to learn. I mean, the Maasai, at least the place where we visited, they worked, their profession was being shepherds. And they had goats. And I told you this week, I don't know, I didn't know the difference between a goat and a lamb. <laughs> now I know the difference. <laughs> but 
they know how to deal with them, you know? And I thought it was so interesting. They, you, you know the, ambient, the environment where you come from. In the night, there was no energy whatsoever. So the kids, they would just walk in the darkness as if it was daylight, as if it was under daylight. And say, how can they do that? And they, and they see, oh, there's a, there's, a, there's a snake here, and there's this there, and there's this there, and they know it. And I said, I don't know any of that. I would have to learn your lifestyle I would have to learn who you are, and I would have to become what you are. So let's say that instead of staying here only three years, I'll stay here for a whole decade. Ten years, I'll live here with you. I'll live in the Bomas, which are their houses. I will live with you where you are, and I will learn how you eat. I will learn how you behave. I will learn how you get married. I will learn how you have children. I will learn everything you do. I will learn how to tend to the flock of the goats, I'll learn everything. And now, now I have the merits, I thought, now I have the merits to be called a Messiah. And then I come before you in 10 years, and then I asked again, if this is the case, now I'm dressed up as a Messiah, I can speak your language, and I'm truly, like, I know your culture, I know your costumes, and I've become part of it. Will I have become a Messiah? And the church elder answered something I couldn't understand, but as soon as he answered, my translator started laughing. I said, why? What he said? He said, you won't have become a Messiah. If you want to become a Messiah, you have to, you have to be black. You have to turn yourself black. <laughs> and then I said, I am sorry. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I can do that. So I guess I'll never be truly a Messiah. It's interesting. I mean, this is something you would never say, like in Europe, for example. For people coming from outside, this is terrible. <laughs> but they, don't have, they didn't have this understanding. And I loved it about that. But anyway, I told them, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I don't think I can do that. But I want to tell you about someone who did that. And that I had reached my point. And I said, Jesus, he came into this world, he dressed up as a human, he dressed up in humanity, and then he learned and spoke our language so that we could understand him, and he wasn't just close to us, he became one of us in every little detail. He walked with us, he slept with us, he, we had meals together, and we could see him. And now you see how the glory, how, how, this, how, how this desire, intense desire of God is so strong that he comes down from heaven and he turns, he dresses like us, and he is there and he lives with mankind and he shows who God is. Always after mankind. Always going after, always searching out for mankind to the point that he comes down and he, God himself, is here. But the, thing is, but the thing is, the problem was, he couldn't be there forever. At some point, he would have to leave. And he knew that already. So in the ministry of Jesus, you see now he's coming to this point where he knows what's coming next. He knows about the crucifixion. And he starts trying to tell the disciples and preparing them for this point where this is going to happen. And then we see that in John chapter 14, it's a very known popular verse. I don't even think you have to open your Bible because it's known to everyone, where Jesus comes to the disciples and he's trying to prepare them for this departure. He's trying to prepare them for his farewell. And then he comes and says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believed in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go... And that's what he's saying. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that also you are where I am. And we see in his words this intense desire. I will come back for you. You don't have to be worried. Do not fret. I will come back and I will take you with me so that wherever I am and wherever I go, you may be with me and we're going to be together. This is intense hope. This is his intense desire that you, we may be with him. But look at us now. I mean, 
2,000 years later, and he's not there yet. And at some point you think, okay, when is this going to happen? I'm getting tired already. 2,000 years of expectancy in the, uh, in the Christian church. And not only as Christians, because the apostles preached that Jesus was coming. Paul preached that Jesus was coming. 2,000 years ago, and we Adventists, we have been preaching about the soon return of Jesus for 160 years, and yet the pioneers all died. And once I heard a sermon where someone said, I guess they would be disappointed to find out we're still here. 160 years preaching that he's coming soon. And at some point, you just think, yeah, I mean, doesn't he get tired from telling that all the time? You know, I told you about my dog, and <laughs> someone told me now that I talked about my, more about my dog than my wife in my sermons. <laughs> but I have a dog at home, I told you all. And um, when I get home, it's, um, it's a girl. Like, it's a female. You know how dogs react. She's still very young. She's barely one year old. And when I get home, she hears, I mean, she recognizes the noise of my car. So when I'm driving on the street, she already knows I'm home. And as I climb up the stairs, she gets very excited. She doesn't bark, but you can see that she's jumping up and down, and she's excited that I'm coming home. And then as soon as I open the door, and my wife was with, 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 with me, she comes and jumps at us, and she wants to, you know, I mean, she's very happy, and she's very excited, and she goes from me to my wife, and from my wife to me, and she won't stop until I catch her in my arms and say, it's okay, Peppa, we're here, we're back. She's so excited that we're back home. And then at some point, my wife said, you know, that's not good. We have to train her that she won't do that. And then I thought, okay, we train her, and then we get home after we train her, and she learns not to do that, and we open the door, and she keeps sleeping there in the bedroom. I don't want that. I like that. I like that she comes at me, and she's jumping at me, and she's so happy. I loved being loved. And this feeling that somebody's so happy that I'm coming home. Now... Jesus, can also, he, he can't wait to finally meet his church forever. But the, question are, but the question is, are we excited about meeting him? Or have we become tired? Have we lost faith? We are too long in this earth already. This delay in the return. Have we become indifferent? To the point where we barely preach about that anymore. We barely talk about that anymore. Just like the trained dog, he's coming in. Yeah, I'm, I'll just keep here in my bedroom. I'm comfy, sleeping. At this point, we ask ourselves, the first question I asked, why do you want to go to heaven? What is the point of heaven? Ellen White says, testimonies for the church. And what is the happiness of heaven but to see God? What greater joy could come to the sinner saved by grace of Christ than to look upon the face of God and to know Him as the Father? And that's what she's saying. What is the point of heaven if not to finally be able to face God, be able to finally stand before God and see His loving face and get to know Him? Personally and physically, that's the high point of heaven. Of course, let's suppose, imagine with me now, we get into heaven uh, uh, finally, and there's a city of gold in all its splendor with its 12 gates and all the walls that go as up as you can see, and the street is shining, and you look at the streets, oh my God, this is real. It's really gold. It's like the Bible said. And then you look around, and I mean, I can see. I don't need glasses anymore, and I can see all the colors. I've been transformed, and I'm so happy about this. I've been improved. And then I look around, and there's the people I loved. And there's the people I so much cherished. I had lost at some point for de to death, and they are there again. And we, re we meet, and we rejoice again, and we are happy. And the animals are tame. And you see the animals. And I just spoke in the German sermon that I would love if I could just see dinosaurs there as well. 
I would love it since as a kid. And you are there and you're so happy with joy. But suddenly you look at the gate and he is standing there. And he's looking at you with those loving eyes. And you know, you may, th you may think, I don't know that face because I don't know how Jesus looks like. I don't know how God looks like, but somehow you have this feeling, even though you don't know his face, this is someone you have known your entire life because this relationship is started right here on earth, and we just carry it into heaven, and he knows, uh, and he looks at you with this very intimate, compassionate uh, eyes, and he, you know that you know him, and we are going to meet him, and then the moment this happens, the moment you look at him, everything else seems to fade away. You're the high point of heaven. It is this meeting with Jesus. Now, I want to tell you how Ellen White illustrates this. She looks into the future at this point, at this meeting with her prophetic vision. Great controversy you can read later. And she says how we all meet Jesus. He she says, for, she says, for example, there is the tree of life, you know, the throne of God, and then there's this river of life fro flowing from the throne of God, and then at some point there's the tree of life, and she describes it as this tree has the roots on both sides of the river, and then it grows in a splendorous manner, and everybody can have access to it. And then she describes how... And the first moment when we get into heaven and there's Adam and Eve and he is thrilled to see creation again. She, she describes it, transported with joy, he beholds the trees that were once his delight, the very trees whose fruit he himself had gathered in the days of his innocence and joy. He sees the vines that his own hands had trained in the past, the very flowers that he once loved to care for. His mind grasps the reality of the scene. He comprehends that this is indeed the garden restored more lovely now than he was than the one he was banished from. He sees this, this known, this familiar scene, and there is the tree of life from which we, got, we lost access, all of us. He was the last one who got to eat from the fruit of tree, uh, from the tree of life, and now he sees the tree of uh, the fruit, uh, the, the, the tree of life, and Jesus Himself is standing right next to the tree, and as he comes close to Jesus, and he des she describes it as not only Adam and Eve there, all the multitude of the saved are surrounding this scene, and they are seeing how it develops, and Jesus is standing there, and Adam knows. I was forbidden of the access to this tree, but now Jesus is standing there, and he knows what's going to happen. He himself extends his arm and plucks the fruit of the tree and gives it to Adam. You know what his reaction is? At this point, he grabs his crown, his shining crown, he throws it at the feet of Jesus, and he runs into his arms because he's finally finally there with him again, the one he loved so much. And Jesus is there with him again. And then she says that as we, the saved that are standing around him, we see the scene, we do the same, we grab our crowns, we throw it at his feet, and we in one, as one, we start echoing through the universe, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain and lives again. This is the final convergence. There's not going to be a separation anymore. There's not going to be there's not going to be sin anymore. We are not going to have to walk away and hide from God anymore. We are going to hide now in his presence, in his glory. That's where we're going to be and that's where we look for. We must not let this hope go. We must not let this hope die. It was this hope that has brought us so far to the point where we are today. And it is this hope that will keep compelling us ahead. We will keep, we'll keep, we'll keep pushing us forward, our driving force, as we preach this message of the coming crucified Savior and the clouds. 
It is this hope that moves me. It is this hope that brought me here today. And I want, you, I want to invite you to share in this hope now because Jesus is coming. And I'm so happy about this meeting in heaven. And I want you to be there. I want you to be share. I want all, all of us to share together the joy of finally being in the glory and the presence of our Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord in heaven, you were our creator. From the very beginning, you knew who we are, we were. You have known us since before we were there, Father. And yet you've seen the paths we have taken. And yet you've, you've seen the wrong choices if we've made. You've seen how we have persistently, consistently tried to hide from you. As we have tried to run away from you, but you're still there, Father. You still go after us. We've seen this week throughout the history of the Bible how, how God, without ceasing, goes after mankind. How he comes after us because he's desperately in love with us. And we want to answer to this calling right now, Father. We look up to the day when we will see that little cloud appear in the heavens. And then it opens. And from there, this multitude and this myriad of angels come pouring out. And the Lord, our Jesus, will be there. And we will be able to contemplate His face again as He calls us home. And that is what moves us. And that's why we are here, because we look forward to this day, Father. Don't let us forget, don't let us forget this hope. But allow your Holy Spirit to burn this hope in our hearts. So that it's So it is about this that we speak and we think and we preach in our every encounter. Whenever we go, we're inside the church or outside the church. Let us burn with the hoping of the return of our Lord Jesus, Father, because we are tired of this world. But while this day doesn't happen, we ask you now that you may keep us in your presence. So that day when we see the face of Jesus... It's not an unknown faith, a face, but it's someone we know because from right now, we have started this relationship. Be with every one of us now, Father. This week of a prayer has come to an ending, but we may hear the people in this church. I may not meet them again on this earth, but there is still another meeting to come. There is still another greater revelation of your glory to come. And we all, we all wait for this day. So be with us now. Let your Holy Spirit drive us. Let your Holy Spirit speak with us and be in our hearts as we leave this church, as we leave this sermon, but with this hope burning in our hearts. It is in the name of our crucified and coming Savior that I pray. Amen. Stand up and wear your mask, and we want to praise our King. And yes, the, the name of the song is Soon and Very Soon.
always I'll say it again rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all for the Lord is near do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus amen